to the degree that you want something is the degree you're afraid of not having. Yeah. God, I wish I started when I was younger. I go, well, yeah, but you didn't. So shut the fuck up and let's <laughs> right. keep going. Right. Like, you can't, <laughs> Nobody changes until they change their energy. And when you change your energy, you change your life. Because it's not till then that it's really real. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is way worse than I thought. It's like, oh yeah, it's way, way worse than you thought. Yeah. But luckily there's more to you than you think. Christine. It's been a while. It's been a minute. Yeah. Well, for podcasting. For podcasting, yeah. It's good to be back. I know. It's good to have you back. Uh, quite a bit's changed since the last time we did a podcast. Yeah, I think it was two years ago, right? So mm -hmm. yeah. we were just reminiscing on all of the <laughs> multiplicity of ass kickings we received in we the really past did. few years. We we've been on kind of a parallel journey in a lot of ways. Yeah. It's been an awesome part of our friendship. And I would say 2017 through 19 was not so fun. And what were some of the things that you had to kind of tackle internally and externally? Well, and there were a lot of blessings to it too. Like one of the things that's changed is I've gotten married since I've been on the podcast. Yeah. So that's a big deal um, to an awesome guy. But the, the main thing I had to tackle, honestly, has been my own fear. Mm. And where it hit me was health and physical things. So it's, I, it's hit me in all areas. It's definitely hit me in career, money, relationship. But I would say the the two things that were most challenging for me were finding love, having a divorce in my early 30s, and then spending my 30s very single, like none single, very single, and wondering, you know, what's wrong with me? What am I doing wrong? And there was always seemed like there was this problem to solve of why am I not in a relationship? And then the other part of it was physical challenges. 2017, it was one thing after another. And it wasn't anything major like cancer or anything like that, but it was one little thing after another little thing after another little thing. And so I had to deal with one, my fear of being alone. Mm -hmm. And two, my fear of, I didn't fear death as much as I felt feared physical discomfort, which was all about control. Because I think when it comes to the body, whether it's an eating disorder or being concerned about something happening, worst case scenarios, it all comes down to control. And that fear of, well, what happens if I lose this? Or what happens if my body does this? Or what happens if I don't have control over this? And so that was my battle, was just coming face to face with, okay, I could feel this way forever and can that be okay? You know, yeah. I was dealing with a large amount of physical discomfort, a large amount of anxiety, was put on supplements last year that gave me panic attacks for a month straight every day. Sometimes I would last two hours. Not on it supplements, everybody. No, no, not on it supplements. <laughs> I love on it supplements. No, he was not involved. It was some like- In this questionable supplement no, program. No, so, some, some specially formulated supplements. And I, I really, there was a point in my time where I really thought I was losing my mind. And, mm. and really, that was about losing control. Well, losing your health, losing yeah. your mind- it's interesting that you say it's about control because for me it's a, a bit because i share some of those same fears mm -hmm. and concerns but for me it's a little bit different for me it's if i'm not able to function at the highest then i'm not able to achieve to do to fulfill my mission my purpose yeah. and therefore i'm not worthy of not only anybody else's love but particularly my own love yep. you know so it's an interesting thing because again it's i think when we've done enough work with our own mortality through the various methods that we've done and kind of accepted that we're all going to die yeah. and when we do it's just a transition like Ram Dass says it's a ceremony and you get to that place you're okay with that but then not living your life and accomplishing what we have in our mind we're here to accomplish to me that's the that's the thing that's yeah. the hardest to accept I think it hits us all differently mm -hmm. depending on what our wounding is depending on what were the things that were hardest for us as children and depending on what we think makes us valuable in the world. Yeah. So you thought what made you valuable is your mission and fulfilling your mission and living into that potential and being a leader and, and everything else that went into that. It was, it was very uh, polite of you to say thought as if it was past tense. <laughs> It's giving me a lot of credit, and well, I appreciate I, that vote I of confidence. You were completely evolved. You know, <laughs> 2020 I'm working was on it. I'm fucking working on it, and it's getting better. But I, I still, 
bristle at the past tense because uh, I'm aware that yeah. that's still there. Like there's still threads of that. Yeah. And there's still threads of feeling like, oh man, like I'm too tired to do this today. And uh, and and I know that's all woven into, yeah. instead of just being like, oh, I'm cool. I'll just rest. I'll just rest mm-hmm. for a little while. I'm mm-hmm. like, no, you won't. <laughs> no, you won't. Mm-hmm. And why? Why? Because I just feel compelled to continue to do. Well, and that's the tricky part. How much is the the compulsion driven by true like an inspiration a calling a soul mission versus our own ego or our own wounds or our own need to accomplish something and that's something i wrestle with too because i have i feel i have a mission i feel really inspired and i really have to discern is this truly something calling me forward or is this my ego wanting something and honestly i think it's a little bit of both sometimes Mm -hmm. it's a little bit of both And how I know the difference is how it feels. So if it feels like a pushing and my inner critic is up and like you should, I'm shooting all over myself, then I know it's that ego, it's that insecure little girl and adolescent in me that thought that her only value in the world was getting things done. That's that voice. But if it feels like a pull, like I'm inspired and I'm excited about it and it's not really about me, then I know it's more... The mission pulling me forward. Yeah. But I don't have it perfect either. I mean, I still wrestle with it a lot. I wrestle between, oh my gosh, I have to do this, this is the most important thing, to nothing I do matters at all, and go back and forth between the two. I think that's really well said between the push and the pull. Where it gets tricky is, is even for someone who's done as much introspection and, you know, risen to a level of awareness where we can track ourselves, our ego also evolves along with us. It's kind of yeah. this red queen you know, battle where it's the predator and the prey, the prey advances and with new camouflage and the predator gets new insights yeah. and, and ability to see through and, and their smell increases. Like it's this constant thing, which is pushing and driving evolution forward. But what happens, and I noticed for me is that my ego gets smarter. Mm-hmm. So if I know like, okay, I know I'm acting in right accord when I'm being pulled. And then my ego will be like, Psh, you're for sure we getting can, pulled, bro. We can <laughs> this talk is a, you into that. Yeah, this is a pulling. <laughs> this isn't a pushing. Yeah. And I'll be like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's it's interesting. You gotta constantly, for me, it's a matter of just getting really still. Yeah. And and you can though, as much as the ego will try and trick you, you can tell the difference in the emotional signature if you're not charged. If mm-hmm. you're charged, you're blind. Mm-hmm. You know, but if you're still and calm and can smile and like look into yourself you'll feel it'll just feel a little different yeah so where do you think you are with self-love today a lot better a lot better and that was a huge revelation i had and i've talked about it before but i you know obviously the relationship six years of polyamory was an incredibly challenging Mm -hmm. and also beautiful experience i learned a lot about myself um at certain point i realized like i just fucking can't take this anymore Mm. and i gotta i'm out of here and i was like i'm going celibate Mm. i'm going celibate Mm -hmm. and then all or nothing aubrey six (laughs) months it's like i'm going celibate (laughs) for six months and by like day seven i was just sweating bullets Mm. i was like (sighs) (sighs) like it was brutal yeah and i didn't know why and then i finally recognized you know day nine i made it nine days which is unbelievably embarrassing (laughs) unbelievably i talked about it on two major podcasts with duncan trussell and fighter and the kid and i put this big post out and i was like damn it nine days and i had people like my homies were like he's gonna make it at least a few months but he's not gonna make it six months i was like i'll make it six months what's your problem i got this nine days and but what it was perfect what was perfect about it was that I recognized the reason I couldn't move forward is because I had so much of my own love mm. patterned through the relationship and also yeah. my own, you know, innate nature. So much of it was wrapped up in the validation that I got from my partners. Yep. And so without that, I was at a complete, you know, below empty level of self-love and my engine was just sputtering. Mm. And so that was incredibly illuminating to recognize that. And then it coincided with kamal ravikant giving his book Mm. love yourself like your life depends on it we subsequently had a podcast and starting to layer in that practice because i understood conceptually the concept of self-love doesn't mean didn't mean i was doing it yeah exactly we can so understand something conceptually i think that's a big problem with personal development we can understand it at at, at a mind level awareness level but actually integrating it and having it shift experientially is a totally different thing Yeah. yeah practice makes the master yeah and like 
I got it. I understood the importance of self-love. I read Don Miguel Ruiz's Mastery of Love. I got it. But I didn't I didn't have a practice to lean on and go mm-hmm. through. So that was huge. Yeah. And that so was huge. When after the nine days when you broke it and you got the fix, then what happened? I just kept getting fixes. But I also started, I also continued working on my self-love. So yeah. that was just something that was going and coinciding with my experience. And then, you know, I had a bigger break, an even bigger break from that when I went to Poland and then I went to the darkness. Yep. And then, um, and that was great. That was like 16, 18 days, but I was, you know, constantly growing, practicing. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. uh, starting in January, and that's why we were talking about it earlier, like this year has been the best year of my life so far. Yeah. You know, and that's, and I don't think it's a coincidence that my self love was the strongest it's ever been. Yeah. And, I also met, well, not met, but I also got in mm-hmm. union with the woman of my dreams. Yeah. At the same time, it was like, it was almost like the universe was just waiting for that to click yep. before this opportunity would really open itself up. Yeah. Which makes sense. Yeah. It's like you had to really get to that place of self love and self acceptance. And, yeah. and we hear this all the time be a great partner to yourself. You don't have to be perfect, but be that partner to yourself. And that's when the most aligned love usually comes in. Or else, Option B is you get in another codependent situation. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and that's not, and then you're just going to be pulling things from this other person. Exactly. That whether you're conscious of it or not, and that's exactly. going to undermine like the beauty and the sovereignty of, of union by choice. Yeah. Yeah. Same exact experience, different face, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. I did that for a while. The whole like dating the a different person, but same exact issue over Mm -hmm. and over and over again because my core issues were around rejection and not feeling like I was ever the one that someone wanted so of course I would create these experiences where I'd go after people go after guys that well it was really my 14 year old who was going after them you know Mm -hmm. the 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 cool guy the popular guy the charismatic guy sometimes the narcissistic guy and I would never ever feel like they wanted me, but I'd pursue and pursue and pursue and and be there and and say yes when I really meant no and try to contort myself into what they wanted me to be and I'd have the same result. They'd break up with me, ghost me, and then be with somebody else. And it happened over and over and over again. And it wasn't until I really looked at, again, my deeper relationship with myself and and knowing that no and again, we know this and everybody listening knows this, but I think we can't hear it enough. No external person, no one, no matter how perfect they are, can ever, ever, ever fill those internal voids. Now, I, I'm having the experience and I want to hear about yours. In my relationship, I feel even more love and I'm definitely growing and being in my relationship has been healing to certain places I couldn't get to by myself. I think partnership and relationship is beautiful for that. I mean, there's some things that the dynamic with Steph has brought into my life that have touched places inside of me that one, I didn't know existed and two, I couldn't have gotten to on my own. But in order to get to that point where I was ready to welcome in that kind of love, I had to love myself enough to start saying no to the experiences and the kind of relationships that just were looping me back in those same old patterns. Mm -hmm. And that's hard to do because they can be kind of addictive. It's like, just this one more time. Yeah. Just this one more time, I'll try it. I'll For get sure. it right this time. And then the same thing happens. And it's so powerful when we break those patterns and we say, no, I'm not going to do this anymore. So that's one aspect of it. And then is saying no to the old patterns. But what were you doing on the, you know, kind of affirmative side to mm-hmm. actually foster the positive states? Yeah that could actually bring that in as well because i think it's a it's a duality you got to yep. remove the negative the things that are actually patterning the same thing and then I'll call in and practice that thing which is going to put you in right accord yeah well a lot of it was probably similar to you those self love practices mm-hmm. that daily checking in with myself one thing i did a lot and do a lot today is one hand on my heart one hand on my belly mm-hmm. i'm safe and i'm loved and talking to myself the way i wanted to be spoken to having a deeper meditative and spiritual practice so like saying like you piece of shit get up and get some shit done no like, not no, that. not that that's, that's a not very that's not good voice yeah so Weird. so yeah yeah that's it i that's my inner critic i call her candy <laughs> she has a name she's she has a stripper name she has a stripper name well i called her candy because it's one of those things that like 
tastes good but isn't good for you. And that's kind of what the inner critic is. Like it's good at getting stuff done, but it yeah. isn't good for you. I wonder if I should change my inner critic voice to a strip club DJ voice. Why, why Aubrey, don't you? <laughs> Aubrey, you need it on the main stage. Aubrey. I don't think you take them as seriously. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I love that. Uh -huh. Try it. Okay. See I'm how it works. It. See yeah. how it works. Um, yeah. So, so now I've completely forgotten the question because I'm thinking about strippers and <laughs> you and you announcing them on stage. <laughs> yeah. Well, your, your self-love practices. Oh yeah. My self-love practices. So one, one, I had to love my inner critic. That was a big self-love practice because I learned that criticizing my inner critic and just shaming these parts of me I wanted to change wasn't going to work at mm. all. So when the inner, when candy would come up or that inner critic would come up or the, the, the self-loathing, the judger, the you're not this, you're not enough this, why can't you be more like this, all that stuff, I'd be like, oh, hello. Hi, Candy, or hi, whoever. Mm -hmm. I hear you. And I know you're just trying to protect me. And sometimes I'd actually journal it out. like Because we have all these voices inside our head. It doesn't mean we're crazy. It's just the multidimensional human experience. We have all these different voices and all these different parts. And when I could separate it out and see, wow, that voice that's being so hard on me actually isn't me. It's just, it's just a part. And if I can observe it and separate from it and see that it's just an aspect, then it, it made it feel not so overwhelming. Yeah. So I would have these conversations with these parts of me. Sometimes, and I teach this and it sounds crazy, but it works. I'd set up two chairs and I'd put me in one and the inner critic in another. And I'd have a conversation and I'd just move back and forth between the chairs mm -hmm. and hash it out with this part of me that was so hard on myself and, and understand it and love it and forgive it. That was a big part of self-love for me is I had to forgive the parts of me that I didn't like. Yeah. I had to forgive the controlling one. I had to forgive the impatient one. I had to forgive the judgmental one, the critical one, the one that, you know, put myself in situations that that I didn't want to be in, you know, the one with no boundaries. And understanding those were all, they were all trying to protect me. They all yeah. had good intentions, just their execution wasn't so great. And coming into acceptance of those parts really, really helped because just shaming and judging myself and, and trying to make the negative or critical voices go away didn't work. I had to welcome them and hear them and just have a different relationship with them. That's essential. I mean, it really, when you, when you start to look at it, that part of you that you love the least is really the limit on how much you love yourself. Absolutely. You know, so you got to go in and love all of those shadow expressions yeah. of you, all of those parts. And that's what actually gets them to soften. Yeah. And if you don't, you're going to run into a host of other issues because the more shame you have about that part, the more you're going to deny it. Yeah. and pretend that it's not there and so even when it is there you're going to pretend that that's not what it yeah. is and it's just going to continue and persist and the only way through that is not actually casting it aside i think that's one of the things that i find you know needs to shift in a lot of the spiritual practices is there's this big concept of extraction like mm. well let's take this negative energy and let's take it away take it away yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know like gone you know what i mean like all right yeah. well that's one strategy but that after you kick that thing out that's all it's going to be doing is trying to get back in mm -hmm. so you're going to perpetually mm -hmm. kicking things out of yourself yeah. and pushing things aside and yeah. maybe it works temporarily or a little bit and because you'll believe like okay got that out yeah. well it's just going to come right fucking back Absolutely. but if you bring it in and be like come here i love you you know i love you candy mm -hmm. You know, like, mm -hmm. I know what you're doing, mm -hmm. and I appreciate that you're doing that. I know you're trying to protect me. Yeah. I know you're trying to move me ahead in the world. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And then that that actually creates real yeah. change. It does, because, again, it creates that. And this is what's so healing for the psyche, too, when we can have this observer awareness. That That's a big part of self-love for me, too, is to know that there's a part of me going through any experience, and then there's a part of me witnessing the experience and holding space for that experience. And... So deep compassion for myself too, because I I am so great at being compassionate for other people. Like you could come to me with anything and I wouldn't judge you and I'd hold space for you. And I am great at that. But when it came to myself, I was not giving myself what I was so willingly giving others. And I think that so many of us do that too. Even mm. parents with their kids, they will love their kids. They will do anything for them, but then they'll be a real shithead to themselves and won't have self-love and won't have self-care. And that was a big aha moment for me as, wow, how can I start giving myself the things that I so willingly give others? And I give others with joy and actually enjoy giving others. Mm -hmm. But yet when it comes to me, 
I think I have to be harsh and critical and I set standards and expectations for myself that I could never live up to. And letting a lot of those kind of walls collapse was, again, scary because that was the that was what worked. That was what f- was familiar, but it was also liberating. And that, I think letting a lot of that stuff go was what opened me up to stuff coming into my life because I, I needed to be at a place of surrender to really welcome in the kind of relationship that I have now. Mm-hmm. I couldn't, I had to let go of some of my go, 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 critical, self-judgmental patterns to be open to the kind of love that I experience now. Otherwise, you end up creating this un, you know, unplanned self-destruction. Yep. You know, where you'll self-sabotage yourself, putting yourself in the same situation because that's the way that you'll perceive things. Yep. That's the way that you'll act. And then so other people will miraculously line up and offer you exactly what your fear is. Yep. And it's it kind of goes back to this idea of like that what you believe you're really going to call in. And a fear is nothing other than a belief in a negative experience Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is going to come to you Mm -hmm. and so like when you're afraid you're more likely going to be drawn towards that thing Mm -hmm. just because that's what you're focused on and that's what you you wouldn't be afraid if you didn't believe it was going to happen absolutely like if you knew for sure it wasn't going to happen are you going to be afraid like no yeah you know exactly so the the that idea the higher your fear the more that you're kind of fueling that with your own belief that Mm -hmm. that's going to happen and then that's going to more readily create that experience for you which i think is also part of us being drawn to those experiences which are going to give us the opportunity to learn yeah you know it's like okay you're afraid of this cool why don't you deal with that thing then you know like oh you're afraid of health issues here you go here's more and more and more here's some odd pressure behind your eyeball (laughs) i remember that that. (laughs) you know like all these all these things will happen just give you the opportunity where it's Mm -hmm. almost like you're like okay now what are you going to do and then if you can actually deal with it that's i think the beautiful thing about something like ayahuasca is it'll take you there but it's in like this kind of controlled bubble where it's all happening through vision and through experience in your mind Mm -hmm. you don't actually have to get a physical ailment you can live the reality of your physical ailment and deal with it in the playground in the sandbox Mm. in dr strange's little bubble where they get to practice the spells they don't really know if they can master yet Mm. you know it's like all right well how are we going to do here i guess i opted for the long road (laughs) (laughs) we both have ayahuasca we both have because there's certain things there's certain things and i want to get back to this yeah there's certain things that no matter all the plants and everything we can't really touch it it won't touch it it somehow It's just not able to really get Mm -mm. in there, even with some of the most powerful tools Mm -mm. that have evolved alongside humanity, like these plants. And then there's other things, other healings that, like I've experienced healing in this relationship that I've had that I was, I don't think I would have ever gotten to. I just don't know how I would have ever really gotten to it unless she was there and that loving container was there to offer that to me yeah because i was trying i was trying hard and i was i was aware of it but i couldn't i couldn't fix it you know i couldn't practice it until i had another dance partner to practice it with it was like reminds me of when i was trying to learn how to salsa and i went to this dude's house to teach me how to salsa but i didn't have a partner (laughs) so like (laughs) i went a couple times and then finally he's like look man you need a partner and i was like yeah i mean i i i see that i just don't have any partner and he's like and then he then he went on this whole rampage and i kind of screwed some steps up and he's like he's like you think you can salsa i was like i don't know and he's like no you cannot and that is why you have no partner because you are shit <laughs> I was like, come on man i'm here all right I'm, all try- I'm trying <laughs> way to reinforce that story yeah, yeah, salsa exactly. dancer teacher <laughs> but uh but yeah i mean if you have stuff that's related to an intimate relationship mm. Like you got to do all the work in advance, but there's going to be still some stuff that yeah. you can't heal until that's a healing, like a productive healing container for you yeah. to heal it. So I'm I'm curious because I haven't caught up with you mm-hmm. since this relationship has come into your life. What was the this, this switch for you in terms of being polyamorous to I'm going to be in this monogamous relationship? Well, I think it's a... Uh, it was finding that person. Mm-hmm. I mean, also, so a couple of things. One, I really, I 
pushed the monog I mean the polyamorous relationship, I did it the most. You really got an A plus in it. I really you did it really the most. Went like all I explored out. and I fucking tried it in every way and there was no boundary and threshold that was not crossed, no fear that I had that I didn't have to actually deal with. Yeah. And you know, what a blessing and you know, super grateful, you know, for Whitney and I think we both offer this to each other like we were able to you know, create an experience which exacerbated like the the greatest amount of growth mm -hmm. possible, but it was fucking brutal, mm -hmm. you know, brutal. So I feel like I got everything that I could learn out of that. Yeah. So then it was a matter of like, all right, is this the most productive way forward once I had learned the lessons? And sure, I could have continued, you know, learning the same thing mm -hmm. over and picking up little pieces and mm -hmm. getting insight, but there's many ways to learn. And yeah. I felt like I was done with that way to learn. Yeah. And I was really calling in a different way to learn and a different way to heal. And it was just a matter of, and I was talking about it long before anything happened with mm -hmm. my partner. And I understand that I'm not using your name and that's intentionally, we're gonna make an announcement, <laughs> but we're trying to keep our relationship a little bit private for a hot minute before yeah. the world kind of jumps in and, and you know gets, uh, gets purview of it. But um, I was ready for it. I was talking about Sacred Union on podcasts. Yeah. I was talking about my next phase forward was, was monogamous. And actually, you know, you were over here for dinner Yep. And I was talking to you and Steph and JP Sears and I was saying like, look, you know, I'm look, I'm interested in, in monogamy here forward. And I didn't think it was going to be with my partner. You know, mm -hmm. I just, I'd given up on that. I remember talking to you. I remember we were sitting down at the Grove for dinner yeah. and yes. I was, I was laying it out. I read yeah. you a poem that I, that I wrote and I was laying it out. I was like, I don't know. I don't know if it's ever going to happen. And I was, you know, a little sad and a little, you know, dejected about this thing that i thought might be mm -hmm. but i didn't know but i mm -hmm. thought it might be mm -hmm. but at a certain point you know maybe nine months ago i wrote her a letter and just kind of let her know how i felt and um i, I remember reading it to kyle and mm -hmm. you know kyle and i read it to kyle and i was like hey man this is the best i can do and he's and he was like yeah man it's the best you can do and i like shed a few tears and after that i just let it go yeah and then all of a sudden you know there it was. There it was. <laughs> there it fucking was. It's amazing was. when you let something go. Yeah. yeah and uh, yep. and not planned at all. But then mm -hmm. once it once it kicked off. And what I didn't understand though is I knew that's what I wanted because I thought it would be a, a better construct and yeah. a better formation. I just didn't realize how much healing it would yeah. facilitate. What kind of healing? Well, one of the big pieces was, you know, and I've talked about this before too, but some of a lot of my own desire for validation came through sexual intimacy mm -hmm. like being loved in that way and kind of chasing the ones that didn't love me in that way and and like trying to prove that i was a man through the bedroom mm -hmm. was like a factor that was always there and so one of the things that happened is actually the very first time that we were intimate which was not that long ago mid-april <laughs> somewhere around there um she actually devised a like a sexual healing ritual which mm. was the first time we were going to have sex mm. and because she, she knew she's known me and she's known that that's been a thing and she went into it we actually took mushrooms and she had this whole plan she's mm -hmm. naturally a medicine woman mm -hmm. and she thought she was going to have to like work on my dick mm. <laughs> like she thought that was like oh i gotta work on your crotch it wasn't that mm -mm. and as mm -mm. soon as as soon as she was in there she's like oh so it has nothing to do with your crotch. It has everything to do with your heart. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. yes, it yes. does. It has everything to do with my heart. And I was just crying. And like, yeah. it, it was, and it was just her pouring this love. Like, I love you no matter what. And yeah. this whole thing doesn't matter. And like, whether, whether we were having penetrative sex or not, mm -hmm. like it was the essence of us intermingling. Mm -hmm. That was what mattered. And that was the release of all of this yeah. other stuff. Yeah. And like from that moment, everything's everything's shifted. Like mm -hmm. I've never had the kind of joy and freedom in my sexual expression mm -hmm. like this. I've had a very active sex life, but it was always with some fear and some judgment and some insecurity. Yeah, always trying to prove something to myself more right. than anything. Right, there was and a transactional piece of it for of, sure. Yeah. And it was mm -hmm. like this was me showing up. It was almost like you know, if you're playing basketball and you got fans watching and you got people tracking you know mm -hmm. giving your statistics and your score yeah. you go back after the game and you look at your you know box score and you're like all right well i got four rebounds you know i i hit you know five out of eight shots like okay today was a good day but then you you play a bad game you're like fuck i fucking suck yeah exactly yeah you know yeah 
so this was like this was like the release of that and that was something that was a big thread that was holding mm-hmm. a big knot mm-hmm. of my own shame and my own lack of self-love mm-hmm. and that just kind of disinter- disintegrated mm-hmm. and untangled and so much anxiety and stress yeah. left my body yeah well, so that, that was, was huge probably part of what thank you for sharing that yeah of course i'm so happy for you <laughs> thank you and i also know whitney was such a soulmate in so many mm-hmm. ways and such an incredible partner in the growth that you you both no doubt. Had, i mean i, I wouldn't together. be who i am today without without her and without a yeah. relationship like the utmost gratitude yeah. for that whole experience. Yeah, she was willing to go on some pretty gnarly rides Ooh. with you. <laughs> I mean, the the courage for her to just yeah. jump in and really go for it. I mean, for yeah. both of us, but you know, as I said, like to do this dance, you have to have a, a partner who's mm-hmm. got some real courage. And, yeah, uh, and she certainly showed she up. She salsa. <laughs> she salsa. She salsa. We were stepping on each other's mm-hmm. feet. We were falling down, but we kept, you know, the music kept playing, and we kept yeah. dancing. And you know, I think. Um, we'll always look back on that period as like some of the most important growth that we've ever had. Yeah. It just couldn't actually get to the final stage because the construct was wrong. Right. You know, you're always competing. Yeah. And like, you if can't you can't really ha- relax. No, you can't. I mean, there's always some level of competition when you're vying for someone's time, mm-hmm. you're vying for for priority, you're vying for attention, mm-hmm. which is just the the nature of yeah. polyamory. And I, I suppose like communism there's a great theory about how it might work but in practice it seldom does yeah. it's just because it's so human nature is so strong yeah i i often thought about i thought a lot in my single years about what kind of relationship i wanted and polyamory especially being in your circle and being friends with you and seeing it i was like well could i do that and and i think for me what would always be the hardest part was i'm so energetically sensitive like i feel everything and yeah. it would be too much for my heart it would be too much for my heart <laughs> and you. and you know what well, that story was so beautiful because in you know the pursuit of women and getting that validation in the bedroom it was just the love you wanted the, yeah. the heart the heart healing and yeah. i relate to that story um i was doing some of my own healing with some somatic workers some sexual healing emotional healing leading up to meeting Steph. And I remember in one of the sessions, I was laying on the table after I'd just done some really deep work. And it was a man and a woman facilitator. And the man said to me, we've taken you as far as you can go. Love will do the rest. Love will do the rest. That's beautiful. And I'm probably going to cry when I tell this story. So about, so Steph and I had Two months of WhatsApp. We we I lived in San Diego. He lived in Perth. So we had two months of communicating, just virtually. And then we met after this two month buildup. And I was already pretty much falling in love with him. And we met in Mykonos, and after two months of just virtual, and moved in together that day. And I remember about a week and a half after we were together, we were making love, and I just went into a like a full body release, tears, like it felt like lifetimes of tears, just something snapped, something let go, something released in my heart and in my body. And I just remember him holding me and just saying, it's okay, let it out. It's okay, keep going, I'm mm-hmm. here. And it it was that that medicine that, and in that, I didn't connect the dots at the time, but afterwards I thought that's what the healer guy meant. Yeah. There's a certain place that I wasn't able to get to on my own that with the right amount of self-love to welcome in that kind of partner and an aligned person who can really hold that space of love, there's some deep healing that can happen. And to me, that's sacred union. Yep. But people ask a lot, what is sacred union? It's not, it, it, it's, it's to my, and I'm curious what your definition of it, but my experience and my definition of it is, you know, two people coming together that, have that self-love that love of a higher power whatever that is and that love for each other that aren't there to get something from the other Mm -hmm. but are there to really serve each other in their own healing and their own growth and and to hold that container for healing so that each person individually and together can reach god yeah i don't know if that was a very good definition but that was (laughs) i think it's i think it is uh i mean i think it's a good indicator of what 
what the what it feels like yeah. and what the quality of it is like yeah. and i think it's it's hard it's hard to describe and i think for me it's still early enough that it's it's interesting so i just have to point to certain things that are different mm-hmm. and i think there's a certain there's a certain maintenance of selfishness that comes in regular kind of partnership yeah right like it's where like well i want this you want this okay we'll compromise it's like mm-hmm. a business deal yeah but in in this kind of union it's almost like it's all about the we and right. and everything is just kind of evaluated based on the value for we mm-hmm. and and the, all things that are difficult in other places like it's difficult to have compersion without sacred union yeah. because you know it's just hard to get there you can th- know the concept compersion is taking pleasure in somebody else's pleasure but when you're there and you really are like this is about the joy and the and both of you are in this mutual reciprocity mm-hmm. space where this is about increasing the maximum joy yeah. to each other and joy then it just becomes really easy because you enjoy doing the things for the other person and both people enjoy doing the yeah. other thing so of course you're going to enjoy holding space not like well i held space for you this time you hold yeah. space for me the next time it's just like whatever no, is yeah, needed yeah there's no scorecard yeah, there's no scorecard it's just like all right this is about we and it's not like well, we'll each have our own things that we'll offer and celebrate mm-hmm. the ability to be independent and the ability mm-hmm. to do anything and not. But there's also like, it's really about what are we going to build for the future? Yeah. What are we going to do? Yeah. You know, what is, what do we want, you know, as a, as a, as a unit? That's the the difference for me. Cause I've been married before I was engaged before I was married. I think we're both on three engagements now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, Third time's a charm. Uh, third time's as well. It definitely is for me. I, I it's it's different. Steph and I definitely have our disagreements. We definitely have our I want to be right moments. Um, but there's there's a, a a deeper commitment not to each other but to the relationship. It's like there's him, there's me, and then there's the relationship, mm-hmm. and it's its own entity. And we know we each have our responsibility in that. And, you know, we had our three month love bubble where everything was great. And then shit really hit the fan for us. Like, so we met in person in July and in October, we were just a mess. We were, we were fighting like crazy. Both of our stuff was up. However, we both were committed to the relation. Like there wasn't an out. Yeah. And I think that that's, that's what makes relationships not make it is it seems like there's always an out like somebody always has an out and as long as you have an out and you're not fully in committed to the relationship then when you get scared there's always going to be a part that's looking for the door Mm -hmm. and once that part is activated you'll start collecting evidence for everything your partner's doing wrong and you'll want to get out i'm not saying you aubrey i'm talking about you like the royal you the royal (laughs) yeah and that was something that we both really realized when we were going through that is if we don't sit in this shit that's coming up for us and work through it together we're just going to go repeat it with somebody else we're just going to have another experience of it and i think that i know for me i idealize relationship a lot i thought well it's the right person maybe you don't have struggle maybe you don't have challenges maybe you don't have the same fights but the truth is your shit's going to come up no matter what and yeah i'm in this beautiful relationship that i would call sacred union but i don't want to say that it's like there's never any challenges but the difference is in the challenges neither one of us is looking for the door we're always looking for how do we grow how do we get through this what's the learning in this what's being triggered in you what's being triggered in me what do you need what do i need is back to that we mm-hmm. that we concept and i think that we don't have enough like what's the right word education such a big word that was so hard for me to find <laughs> um on on relationships yeah i think we we see our we see our family we see hollywood we see you know different unhealthy models and so many people are are struggling in relationships because they're expecting their partner to fix them and save them and heal them and do their inner work for them aka they're expecting their partner to be different yeah you know what i mean like it's like we come into these relationships with a lot of unresolved wounding. And we think that it's our partner's job to somehow fix it, to somehow make it better by either making us feel a certain way or by changing. Mm -hmm. And it never works. It Mm -hmm. always comes back to what do I need to heal inside myself? How can I do this work? And how can my partner 
hold the space for me to do that work yeah. rather than do it for me. Yeah, that's crucial. I also think there's an, you know, as you're talking, there's this, in other relationships, there was always things that were placed above the relationship. Mm. And I think that goes to the very nature of sacred when something's sacred, and that's just us deeming it as mm-hmm. sacred. Like we de- we declare, all right, this is sacred. This is a sacred ceremony. Let's mm-hmm. say we're doing, let's say we're doing plants, you know, mm-hmm. it's sacred. All right, you don't show up drunk. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like this is sacred. Yeah. There's nothing more important than this. You don't show you know, up late. Like, you don't show up late. Mm-hmm. You don't bust out your fucking phone in the middle of your ayahuasca ceremony <laughs> and be like, let me just check some emails real quick. Like you're, you're fucking in, yeah. you know? And, and I think in a lot of relationships, there's lots of other things that are above it. Maybe yeah. it's your fear. Maybe it's your shame. Maybe it's your lack of vulnerability. Maybe it's your selfishness, which is played out as dishonesty. You know, mm. like where you're like, well, I want to kind of do this, but I don't want to share it because then yeah. we have to like, there's all kinds of things that you place above like the health of the relationship. And I think you really have to sacrifice all that shit. You really got to put this relationship like, all right, this is the, this is the priority thing. There's nothing else that I'm going to allow to exist above this mm-hmm. in this priority position above the relationship. That's what makes it sacred. It's like, this is the thing yeah. that's, and I've never really, you know, fully gotten to that place before, but it's fucking great because then it orients everything else like Mm -hmm. everything else you can move through because you know all right well this is sacred this Mm -hmm. thing this other stuff is transitory temporary we can just navigate through this we'll figure it out yeah and also that and then going back to what you're saying that commitment that burn the boats commitment we're like this is it this is fucking it Mm -hmm. i think i say that with a caveat because i think sometimes people will put commitment for commitment's sake up there and they'll be like, I'm just gonna fucking stick through it no matter what. Yeah. And it's just exactly it's just continuing this toxic pattern. Yeah. Like, no, actually don't be committed. Yeah, that's <laughs> like, I, I feel like that's like more complacency when you're just yeah. in something because you're you're it's 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 dead, it's going nowhere, you're having the same argument, no one's working on it, but you're just sticking it out for the purpose of what? Sticking it out. Because right. commitment is what you do. Yeah, yeah. Because you know? I, I, what our great grandparents told us about marriage. Right. You know? I, yeah. I think that it's going to be hard, but the only thing you need to do is stick to stick it. Stick with it. Just be <laughs> married for 50 years, be miserable because you got to do it for the kids. Yeah. Because yeah. them seeing two unhappy people, but at least we're living in the same house is much better for them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't, I, I'm glad you pointed that out because commitment just for just to say you're committed is much different than committing to something bigger than you. So, mm-hmm. like to me, yeah, I'm committed to Steph and Steph is committed to me, but we're committed to sacred union and the relationship and what we can create together and the healing work we can do together. And I think a lot of people miss that in their partnerships, unfortunately. And then I know so many people, they're they're growing and they're listening to your podcast and doing the retreats and maybe doing medicine and they're 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 working, but their partner isn't. And that's a really tough place to be. And I know I've been in that place in the past. And I'm curious what you would say to somebody in that position that they're they're growing, they're working, but they have a partner that isn't on the same path. Well, I get that question a lot. Yeah. And I'm sure you do too. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's interesting. I think the one thing that you have to do, and I've made, because I know this from my own mistakes, is one thing that I didn't do very well was I would love somebody for what I believed they could be, which was Mm -hmm. also related to what I wanted them to be. Mm -hmm. So I loved a version of them that they were reaching for or that I wanted them to reach for, but not exactly loving them as they really are. So what that created is instead instead of compelling them to try and reach for that thing that I would love, it actually just compounded shame about what they were at what who they actually were and that shame would create distraction patterns addiction patterns you know ways in which they would just not try to think about that thing which i was reinforcing the shame they had in their own selves Mm -hmm. about what they were doing by my own judgment which is basically saying you're this but if you were this i would love you so much more Mm -hmm. it's this whole conditional love paradigm which doesn't work so step one is you got to love them as they are yeah and if you can't love them as they are, if you're loving them for what they could be, you're making a mistake and you gotta, you gotta unwind that. And if you can't love them as they are, well, it probably means it's not the right person to be with. So step mm-hmm. one, love them as they are. Mm-hmm. And then step two, you have to just walk the walk. That's it. You know, just walk the walk and be That's that it. thing. And then as they see you, you know, happy, growing, 
thriving, they're going to have a reaction and they're either going to want to jump on that boat or they're going to want to smash your boat yep. and try to tear down everything you're doing and, and tell clear. you why it's wrong. And then, then you, you know. don't have to decide. It's then you know. clear. Yeah. I would add to step one, don't judge them or get on your like life coach soapbox and tell them how they need to change. Yeah. Because I've tried that and it didn't work out so yeah. well. It never works out. No, it never works out, especially, well, in any dynamic, but especially in female to male. <laughs> like it definitely doesn't work. So ladies, if you want your guy to get into personal development, don't tell him all the things he's doing wrong. Mm -hmm. Not going to work out so well. And I think the, you know, going through experiential practices is great. You have to be mindful. I've definitely drugged people hand in hand through some of my psychedelic journeys. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's been productive. Sometimes it hasn't yeah. because they haven't been choosing it. But if you can share a mm -hmm. taste and really make this about a mutually shared experience like hey let's both of us do breath work together yeah and like let's fucking go yeah. and let's experience this thing and then you'll have something to talk about you'll have something to bond over it'll create this kind of positive energy of both mm -hmm. of you guys going through it and it doesn't have to be extreme it could be both of us all right let's cold plunge together let's breathe together let's do an ecstatic dance together let's do anything let's meditate together whatever mm -hmm. and make it about something that's connective for both of you i mm -hmm. think that'll help mm -hmm. you know kind of lead people through if you start if you talk too much about like what they need to change or what they need to do it just doesn't really work i mean we only yeah. can really change when our own voice is telling us to do it and the way our own voice is heard is when we're engaging in these practices i agree i yeah. agree <laughs> that's why i'm glad i have a partner who's committed to the work that was my yeah. number one thing is i don't want to have to drag somebody along Mm -hmm. This work is so important to me. Like I, it, it was a non-negotiable for me. And I, I learned the hard way by dating people that weren't that into it. And yeah. it, just, it just never worked out. So I think we have to be super clear on what our values are and not look at compatibility as, you know, they like the same music and they like to travel and all these things. That's not as important as what are someone's core values. And, you know, that, those were very serious. Those were the initial questions I asked Steph is, his commitment to growth and did he want a monogamous relationship mm -hmm. because those were the two things that i was clear that i wanted and i wasn't going to waste my time anymore i i, I tried to like t convince myself into things and i think a lot of us do that again candy would come in and be like christine you're so uptight just like <laughs> you're too picky you know just go for it and and she'd talk me into things that you know, I remember chasing after somebody that was just a dead end for like three years. And I'm glad I did because I learned a lot and I um, was able to like see and heal pieces of me that if that person didn't exist, I probably wouldn't have got to. But I have such compassion for that time because I really was like obsessed with, not obsessed, but just dead set on a dead end. And I think yeah. a lot of us get in that position and we think it's about the person. And I remember my friends, cause this was a guy in LA and a lot of my friends knew him and they would just be like, Christine, snap out of it. Like, why do you keep going back to a Chinese restaurant when you want nachos? Like it's not gonna happen, <laughs> it's just not gonna happen. But I was able to really see that it wasn't about him. Again, it was about that adolescent who never thought she could have the guy that she wanted. And I just put that issue on him. I plastered that issue on his face. And some part of me thought, well, if I could get him, then that issue would be resolved. You could redeem yourself. I could redeem myself. And it just, it just never works that way. No. Never works that way. Yeah, it really doesn't. And, uh, and I think, you know, for me too, I th just going back to touch on polyamory versus monogamy again, you know, I think there is a lot of virtue in the understanding of polyamory and that love should not be possessed and that mm -hmm. we shouldn't it shouldn't require ownership like true love is like the sun it just shines yeah. you know and there's it's philosophically it's sound in that regard and just the way it's actually sound and it's actually true in some extent to say that everything is sacred nothing is sacred because everything is sacred mm -hmm. and that's one way it's like one octave that you can look at things and like love shouldn't be love shouldn't have any ownership shouldn't have anything but that's denying the ability to choose and make something what you want it to be. Mm -hmm. You know, like, so choosing to make something sacred or choosing to have a love that's unique to you two and make that a sacred love, mm -hmm. it's just a choice. 
it doesn't mean that you're declaring that this is the nature of love mm-hmm. and i think that's where people kind of get at least i got a little lost a little squirrely as i understood the nature of love capital l love universally yeah. from the divine perspective just as i understand sacredness universally from the divine perspective all is god all is love but we're not divine completely no we're still very human we're very human you know this is not we're not we're not full we're not fully immersed in the unicity that can look at everything from that purview we're having a human experience we got flesh we got boundaries this is a table this is my hand like i can't meld my hand into the table no it's there's a boundary there so it's like respecting that we can choose we can choose how to navigate Mm -hmm. this and choose to deem something as different and i think it's still going to work as long as we continue to make that choice when it becomes an obligation or a contract well that's that's when it's a problem because that's when it's going to create resentment and that's when the resentment's going to create a monster that eats the love mm. but if like both people are like you choosing this today mm-hmm. yeah i'm choosing this today. sweet mm-hmm. let's choose it and then i think it stays like fresh and it stays like virtuous and obviously you know meets telling this story 10 years from now after i've chosen for 10 years yeah. is going to be more valuable than yeah a few months from of this but i i see the path i see the pathway forward and i know that it's it's just a choice do you see yourself going back to polyamory no why not i think what would i think the virtue of this choice mm-hmm. to be in a in a union that's sacred is the most beautiful and productive choice that i could make mm-hmm. and it's not that i think i won't ever have an urge or i won't see someone to be like wow i'm very physically attracted to that person yeah i'm aware that that's going to happen you know of course and it'll happen for her too yeah and i'm not it's not out of the out of the realm of possibility that if if she came to me and it, first of all i'm grateful that i've been in this experience for six years mm-hmm. if she came to me as like whoa man you know like i just I just saw this dude and I just can't stop thinking about him. And I, mm-hmm. I'm like, I take a deep breath and mm-hmm. swallow and probably hit a little tobacco and be like, all right, <laughs> like I've been there. Like, yeah. it's fine. We'll go, you know, like go for it. And like, really, that would be your answer. Go for it. For sure. Mm. You know, I think at that point, if she was really sure and I was sure that she was sure that she wanted it and was aware of everything and she just needed to experience this thing. I've been there and I know that I know the dangers of it mm-hmm. but I think if that was her choice that was her choice and if that choice if that choice unwound the relationship that's a possibility and if it's worth it if it's worth it and if that's the thing that you need because you have to see that path okay yeah you know and and I think that's the that's the advantage of for me having been through this situation and of course I've learned so much and I learned how to how to navigate that in the healthiest way possible so it's not like an ironclad rule like you know under no circumstances will we ever engage in sexual intimacy with another individual it's certainly not my intention that that's ever going to be the case mm. but if that arises and then that's an unavoidable experience and we think that experience is actually more productive than the other experience well, then it's just a conversation yeah well i mean it's hard to talk in hypotheticals because we really don't we really don't know you know exactly how you'd feel because it's a different Oh, it, it would suck different. like yeah. there's no doubt it would suck but yeah. I, for me i can't i can't, i'm almost unwilling to put myself in a position where somebody wants to do something mm-hmm. they're aware of what they want and they're doing and they really want to do something and i'm like nope you can't do that yeah it's just not me it's almost like i just accept and surrender and allow them to do it even if it seeds the you know sows the seeds of destruction like it's part of my nature to do right. that and maybe that'll change and maybe i won't feel that i won't have that kind of libertarian permissive kind mm-hmm. of like i surrender kind of attitude but that's the way i that's the way i kind of see it going down i just cannot imagine that happening yeah it's just so i mean this is so on another level than anything we've ever experienced before like would we and we, she has experience in polyamory as well and yeah. like would we ever want to open up that open up that door again and potentially you know sacrifice what we have here yeah. it's a pretty easy it's a pretty easy thing to consider right now well we're back we're back to sacred right yeah because when something's sacred you just hold it in a different way and i i can't imagine if, if steph came to me and said he wanted to be with someone else i would definitely have to take a deep breath probably wouldn't have tobacco <laughs> uh, <laughs> that would just make me feel worse but i i you know he he is a step like he is freedom is his core value like he cannot feel and that's been 
something that I've had to work with in our relationship because he likes to be free and he likes no restriction and I like order and balance and all these things. And I don't like confine him or anything like that, but I've had to really surrender into deep trust mm -hmm. and, and we're back to control, right? So I've, sometimes when I feel scared, I want to control. Like even in this whole pandemic situation, when it first happened, we'd, we'd go to the grocery store, we'd come home, I'd have him wipe off everything with, you know, the super healthy Clorox wipes that we have. Mm -hmm. And he'd be like, we don't, we, we really don't need to be doing this. And I'm like, no, 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 we, we need to like, just, just listen to this and stop touching your face. And, and I would, I kind of would go into that control because I felt scared. Yeah. And that's where he's been my teacher because he, it's not like he won't let me control him, but he's so clear in his need to be free and not controlled that he'll like lovingly remind me when you attempt to control and the wiping off the food is just a silly example sure. but when my fear comes up and i i grip and i want him not to do something like i want him not to take a trip in the mountains because i'm afraid something's going to happen to him or something like that he will gently and lovingly remind me this is this is the way that I will feel constricted and this is what will bring problems in our relationship. Mm -hmm. And so that's really my edge is to, re to, to deepen in trust and deepen in surrender. Be like, okay, you wanna go on a vision quest in Death Valley for five days with no food and maybe people supervising you, maybe not. Okay. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and I, of course that brings up fear in me. Sure. But it's back to, what when something is sacred, you also not necessarily allow, but do your best to understand what the other person truly needs. I think it's serving. It's also serving the higher expression of that other person. Yeah. Right. So if you don't hold, your, even if if you don't hold your boundary, mm -hmm. you're pandering to someone's ego or pandering to their fear. Yeah. You know, and you can allow a little leeway. Like he can wipe the veggies off. Yeah. Because it would be too abrupt and too abrasive. There's a way to communicate. But as he's wiping, just gently saying like, hey, you know, just check in with your fear. Yeah. As and he's wiping, he as he's wiping the macadamia <laughs> milk, you know, in carton. And he's like, How just do you know we drink macadamia milk? <laughs> I just, just I intuited it. it. It's the best. Um, <laughs> but, you know, as you're doing that, just, just kind of be casually aware yeah. of that because he understands that, one, you know, you guys are committed to having the best union possible. So mm -hmm. if he's... Being, he shames me yeah mm -hmm. if he shames you that's not going to work or if he, if he allows you to overrun him he's going to build some resentment and want to kind of you know he's going to take that milk and rub it on some exactly some rails outside <laughs> exactly. people have been touchy. <laughs> just to scare me <laughs> but uh but yeah you have to kind of serve that higher nature of the other person sometimes that means holding a boundary yeah. and saying like okay here's the here's the boundary or here's here's my experience mm -hmm. in this situation and so you have to get it. So even with that Death Valley thing, even though it's presumably hypothetical, although it sounds like it could be. No, even, it's happening. And, oh. <laughs> no, this is not hypothetical, Ops. This is, this is happening. It's okay. happening in if, if, like two weeks. Yeah. So then like in my in my opinion, I'll, I'll get your opinion. This is actually happening to you. But he has to be aware of what concerns that's causing you. Mm -hmm. And you have to be aware of the need that he has to go do this yeah. and the virtue of that. And you both have to sit with the reality that you're experiencing and then just be like, Okay. Yeah. What are we going to do? It. Yeah, exactly. You know. Exactly. We and we've been there before. We've had lots of different points in our relationship where we've been on opposite sides, not opposite sides, but we've just been in, in our own stuff. Yeah. And what I love about my relationship is that he doesn't make me wrong for my feelings and I don't make him wrong for his because I think that's a mistake that we make not just in romantic relationships but in life. We project our model of the world the way we would handle a situation onto someone else and expect them to act like we would act instead of really seeking to understand why is this important to you? What does it mean to you? Tell, tell me more. If only we said, tell me more, more than we said, more than we told people what we think they should yeah, do. Yeah, totally. You know? Totally. I think there's one thing that I've noticed that causes a lot of judgment and trigger and reaction. A lot of times people say the thing that you're triggered most about is something that you don't like about yourself. And I, I never really resonated with that because I can think of so many things that aren't that way. And what I realized is that's part of it. 
part of it. Maybe it's the thing you don't like about yourself. Maybe it's the thing you love about yourself. Mm. And if they violate that thing you love about yourself, well, then you're going to be an incredible amount of judgment. It's still based on some conditionality yeah. and some judgment that you have. Either you dislike something about you, and then that'll bother you if somebody exhibits that, or you love something about mm -hmm. you. Let's mm -hmm. say like honesty is this, this thing that you love. You're a really honest person. You know, like the thing that you're going to judge most in another person is when they're dishonest. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's the thing. And it's it's because you love the fact that you're honest and that makes you a virtuous person in your own mind. And that makes you worthy of love. So that could be consciousness. That could be compassion. That could be mm -hmm. emotional sense to every anything that we really love about ourselves when someone and, and really love more than anything else about ourselves. Yeah. When someone violates that, you're going to be like, I can't stand you. <laughs> You're so wrong. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's an interesting thing to just track and be mindful. People are and they're people are great button pushers. Mm -hmm. They then relationships will do it. And I've I've coached, gosh, I don't even know how many people at this point. Since 2004, I've been coaching people. And relationships are just such a, a pain point for so many of us. Either we don't have one and we want it or we don't, we aren't happy in the one that we're in, or one of us is growing and one of us isn't. But they, if we can really stop looking again to that other person as the reason for either our happiness or our suffering, and it comes back to what we were talking about earlier, that self-love. And relationships are excellent at triggering our unresolved stuff from childhood. We, the early stages of our relationship tend to be what we didn't get from mom, what we didn't get from dad. We end up seeking that out in a partner. And that's another dead end because mm -hmm. no partner can ever heal your mommy and daddy wounds either. And it's, it's just, again, back to that hard word I couldn't say before, the education about why we're attracted to the people we're attracted to. Yeah. Oftentimes that physical attraction isn't actually physical sexual attraction. It's an issue-based relationships. It's like my issues are dovetailing with your issues. Oh, I had a father who cheated on me. Oh, wow, you're kind of a guy I can't trust. We're totally attracted to each other. Yeah. Because that's what brings people together to resolve a lot of stuff. And I think that one thing that's been important to me to learn in my relationships is that certain relationships have an expiration date. They come, they teach us a valuable lesson. We work through our issues, but trying to make something go beyond its expiration date is just misery. And that's where a lot of people are. They, they've, they've come together, maybe they've learned something, they've triggered each other, they've pushed each, other button, buttons, each other's buttons, they've gone as far as they could, but then they're so afraid of breaking that commitment or the unknown that they end up staying mm. together for the sake of just staying together. Yeah, that quest for, the quest to validate yourself through somebody else you know, changing or somebody else loving yeah. you or finally giving you that thing that you've been looking for. It's a Sisyphean challenge. It's something that'll always be a little bit farther mm -hmm. and it's never going to really work. Like no. you gotta, you gotta go, you either learn through love and heal through love yeah. or you heal. And that actually full stop, you heal through love. It's either love you apply to yourself or love that's fostered in a kind of union in, a, in an unconditional unconditionally loving mm -hmm. container mm -hmm. that allows like love is the substrate for healing it Period. is and that's what we need more than anything right now during this whatever we want to call it pandemic global crisis whatever we want to call it is and when i when i in my deep meditations when i'm really thinking about what's happening in the world i i, I keep coming back to its love and what unfortunately is the predominant thing right now is fear. We've mm -hmm. got so many people just in fear and so many people triggered right now and so many people being programmed because when we're in fear, we can be really programmed. Super we're, susceptible. We're really susceptible to whatever the powers that be you know, tell us. So this is an incredible time for people to do some deep work, some of that deep shadow work, that deep inner child work to really look at What's pushing their buttons right now? What fear button is pushed? What is this uncertainty doing? And what's your response? Mm -hmm. You know, are you rebelling? Are you judging? Are you hiding? Are you isolating? Are you waiting for somebody to come tell you what to do? And how can you have enough self-love to really seek truth and ask inside, all right, like, what's really true for me? And what do I feel like I need to do in this moment? And 
what would love do? When, mm -hmm. That's what Steph and I ask in any kind of argument is what would love do now? And love doesn't sit there and just meditate and pray for it to be better. Love actually requires action mm -hmm. as well. And love requires doing the difficult work and saying the difficult things. And I don't know, I'm just, with, with working with people for as long as I have on the psychological level, I see so many parallels to what's happening now to what happens when someone's in any kind of crisis, be it a breakup, a health crisis, a work crisis, whatever. It's a massive amount of uncertainty and then all their inner wounding gets triggered. Mm -hmm. And whatever they felt as a child, they feel in that moment. And they have two choices, either hide and numb and hope that it ends soon and hope that time heals all wounds, which PS time doesn't heal all wounds. <laughs> or they go, whoa, what is this reminding me of? What is this triggering? What can I learn from this? And what do I need to go back and heal and resolve? And I think that's what more of us need to be doing is the, is the latter right now. Absolutely. I think that's, this is a, it's a universal stressor and yeah. you know, how people respond to that stress, it's all a choice. Yeah. And I think people, when they're afraid, they're also going to be a lot more divisive. They're going to point out enemies and point yeah. out threats. And that's one of the things that I think is the most troubling that I see out of anything. Sure, economic issues and a lot of things that are can be heartbreaking to hear these stories you know and i can hear these personal stories from different people who've had restaurants or had things that have been really challenged even with yeah. the stimulus money and whatever that may not make it and it's their dream to create this and they're going to have to start from scratch those stories are challenging known people who've gotten sick those stories are challenging all of these things are challenging but the thing that troubles me the most is the way that we're dividing Yep. you know like some so if somebody has an opinion you know that all right like let's look at this you know this is an opinion that i have like let's look at this from a holistic standpoint let's look at everything that's transpiring let's have a logical calm conversation mm -hmm. and figure out what makes the most sense mm -hmm. all even that will trigger people and be like no you just killed my grandmother and i'm like what yeah what really yeah. you know it's like and then so for me it's like all right you know just can I love that response too? Can I love everybody? Because I, no matter what, I don't want to participate in any of the division. Right. Because that's not going to help anything. So like no. people can stand in their own righteousness about what they think is right. Oh, I'm, you know, I wear a mask even when I'm alone in my car and I'm doing the most mm -hmm. and everybody else is not doing the most or mm -hmm. pieces of shit. Mm -hmm. That's not going to help. Or somebody else is going to be like, look at that person in the car, the total sheep you know, mm -hmm. fucking blind, still asleep, mm -hmm. you know, continue taking the blue pill, motherfucker. Yep. You know, like that's not going to help either. Like either side no. is not going to help. It's only going to be like, come on, come on, everybody. Let's all fucking team people this thing together. It, that's the, that's, the, that's our only way through. Yeah. Because it, in uncertainty, we want control. And a lot of times judging and having opinions about other people gives us the illusion of control. If I can think about all the things that piss me off and all the things other people are doing wrong, then I don't have to sit and deal with my own fear that's coming up. I don't have to confront my own demons because I can just point and yeah. blame the finger at other people. And and I'm with you. I, I really am not in a place of judging anyone, but I am in a place of, holy shit, like we got to come together. We're, got we're, to. we're like, this is not going well. No, <laughs> this is no, it's not. Not going well. And, and you know, people hating on Trump and, it's like if he fails america like we all fail like we 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 need to it's not looking at one person or one leader wait waiting for someone to come save us but it's not pointing the finger at anybody right now because it's not doing anything at no. all and you know i know it's great for us to sit here and talk about it and and then i ask myself okay well what am i doing you know what 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 am i doing and i'm doing what i would encourage anybody to do which is i'm continuing to do my own inner work I'm dealing with my fear. Like the biggest fear that's come up for me around this has been losing someone I love, particularly my husband. And I've allowed myself to go into that fear and mm -hmm. feel it and not try to circumvent it by getting him to Clorox all the vegetables, but really going in and feeling, all right, like if he gets sick and something happens to him or something happens to someone I love, like let me feel that, let me confront that. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people are afraid to do that because the law of attraction has told us, no, we can't feel those feelings because then we'll draw it to us. But I disagree because I think 
actually going into the fear and feeling it, the energetically you're actually in is acceptance, not fear. Yeah. And that's a high vibration. And so by going in and confronting the things we're afraid of and, and looking at it instead of avoiding it and blaming other people, then we're actually in the frequency of acceptance. We're actually not resisting something. And then I think that gets us closer to love and closer to innovation. So that's what I've been doing, just going inside, doing my own work, working with my own triggers, and, and, and just keep asking, okay, what would love do now? What can I do now? And trying to help as many people as I can do their own inner work, you yeah. know? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's when you're afraid of something, you will, you will find a way to, to deal with it. Mm-hmm. And you're either going to deal with it in the physical, like we we're saying, or you deal with it on your own terms. Exactly. Like, you, like, you're afraid of dying. All right, well, deal with your fear of death. Go straight into it. Doesn't yeah. mean that you're going to die because you're dealing with your fear of death. As you it's there anyway. Out. It's there anyway. <laughs> so this is the only way through. Yeah. The only way through is to confront it head on and be like, all right, here you are. I'm going to die. You know, memento mori. Remember that you're going to die. Yep. Like that's it's essential to kind of just go through and meditate on all of these different things. Mm-hmm. It's whether it's psychology that's saying it's a spo- exposure and response therapy, or mm-hmm. whether it's just the stoic wisdom, or whether it's the mm-hmm. samurai bushido code. There's many different ways that are all pointing to the same thing. Like mm-hmm. you gotta, you gotta go fucking address this. You gotta like really dive in and then you can and then you have a chance of dispelling it yeah and then when you dispel it internally you lessen the need to actually dispel it externally yeah you know yeah well i found after i did that a lot of my fear softened i'm not saying it's not there i'm not saying that you know it doesn't come up from time to time again just like candy pops her head up from time to time it's i'm not walking on water over here however it, it the intense like the the energy it takes to suppress fear, to suppress any big emotion, fear, anger, grief, resentment, rage, whatever it is, is massive. And And underrated. Yeah, it's so underrated. It's so underrated. so underrated. And you have to like drink more or eat more or work more or have more sex in order to- And you're exhausted. You're exhausted. You know, and I know know people who are tired all the time and are, you know, reaching for their Adderall and alcohol and all these things. And it's just because they're trying to keep these keep shit keep down in the water. basement yeah. you know and it's just constant force of their psyche pushing, pushing stuff it, pushing down pushing it pushing it down and the 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 longer you hold it the more force is required and i know it's growing it's 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 growing you're just adding more to yeah. it all the time and I, listen i know it can feel really scary to look at fear or past traumatic experience or any of those things but they're there they're, they're there and i think part of why we are where we are as a society as a society is because it's been too easy to repress and suppress stuff mm-hmm. we life's been too easy we haven't had to confront a lot of things we have way too many no- numbing strategies way too many places for distraction and it it hasn't been hard enough in a lot of ways and i see that with my work people don't come to me for a retreat or for coaching because life is great and they just want to get better they come to me because the shit has hit the fan in some aspect of their life and they want they're like all right i can't do this anymore like i need i need a different way like i need to do the work yeah and so you know in thinking about all this there's the i guess you could say optimistic side of me that is like all right maybe this is the great awakening on so many levels at least um, one of them at least one of them i think it's going to take a few because we seem to be pressing the snooze button a little yeah bit. i mean and i think that we have to have that level of acceptance that it may have to get a little yeah. bit worse yeah you know, i mean there's those of us who move from inspiration and but most of us move from some form of desperation and even for us who tend to move from inspiration i was having this talk with you about your book mm-hmm. and i was like oh yeah you yeah. want to finish your book have a fucking deadline <laughs> you know, know like that's a good way to <laughs> finish I'll a book maybe i'll just make you my publisher and give me a deadline. yeah for sure <laughs> like because even still like the the desperation of having something that's fixed something that's yeah, terminal that ends can actually facilitate that and this is just that you know pressure coming from the universe on all sides it's hitting us i don't think i can think of anything that's ever hit so many universal I points either. Globally, globally you know globally and it's a fa- very fascinating time to be alive that's for sure no doubt that's for sure but i just keep coming back to and this isn't some kumbaya thing love really does heal all every heartache every physical disorder i have it hasn't been a supplement it hasn't been anything external it's always been love yeah 
always love and acceptance yeah you know accept the fact that you're gonna die yeah and it's okay yeah like we're all gonna we're all gonna hey, die i grew up in a funeral home my grandfather my <laughs> grandfather owned a funeral home yeah. so i had a real early um initiation to death i'm not it's interesting i'm not as afraid of my own death as i am the death of people i love sure that's where it hooks that's into a, me that's a tough one i remember uh you know when don howard the last time i saw him i knew it was going to be the last time i saw him mm. and i remember thinking that he was you know in, in his last days and uh i started to cry and then uh, his voice came into my head and it was well where do you think i'm going brother and Aww. i was like oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah like you're there you know that yeah. that that essential unborn and undying part of you is going to be around and that's yeah. a that's i think to me the you know obviously thinking of my fiance dying or mm -hmm. thinking of my parents super hard but there's just this unshakable belief because of my own experiences mm -hmm. that like i've talked to my grandma you know every month at least mm -hmm. in my own meditations and my own visions and whether that's the memory of my grandma and it's just her wisdom doesn't matter doesn't matter mm -hmm. you know and so either way like i felt her presence there with me and like yeah. she's been there to comfort me since she passed 12 years ago yeah. you know all the time mm -hmm. and i think that's something i think it's why i encourage people to go and see for themselves i don't expect anybody to listen to me talk about that and be like have any kind of any degree of comfort until you've actually communicated and like mm -hmm. felt the sensory experience of feeling the presence of someone whose mm -hmm. physical expression and articulation and manifestation and form has left and then you're like oh, oh but you're still here yeah. i can't hug you but you're still you're here still here and i think that's there's so many different levels that i think will allow people to ease their fear mm -hmm. about death about life and then hopefully everybody just gets to a place where we're doing our best to just enjoy this fucking awesome opportunity we have to live on earth at this yeah. time yeah we have to get back to living living really living yeah not not hiding the and love for life has to has to be greater than our fear of death you know and that's the place hopefully this is one of those dominoes that's going to push us more in that in that way and maybe you know our life will have to be restricted more mm. until we really say no what i don't even fucking care yeah like life and love is way more important than fear and death yeah so i choose life and love i choose life and love seems like the best choice for me <laughs> <laughs> seems like the best choice for me christine i love you I this love is you great too. i'm so happy for you thank you being your friend i don't even know how long i've known you a while now a while and just seeing your journey and i always thought you'd get to this place yeah i doubted it i doubted it a lot but i'm didn't. glad that you held it down for me i, didn't. I appreciate that i didn't yeah you need good people in your corner yeah well and you know we all it's it's we we learn the way we learn and mm -hmm. our route is our own individual route and we can't judge it and it, it, it nor just, was anybody gonna shorten the route for me no not at all <laughs> nor are we gonna shorten the route for other people hardly i mean we can just point to things so that they can see it for themselves when they're ready yeah but well i just for for anybody listening if you feel that because i know you and i both felt that at some point that deep call for sacred union don't let go of it yeah because it's real and we can't control the timing or how it's going to come but when it comes it's definitely worth it so worth it mm. yeah i mean i'm the poster child for doubting that it was ever going to happen and having it actually happen mm -hmm. you know i mean i was open to it i just didn't really believe it was going to be there mm -hmm. some part of me must have some part of me must some part have of you did some part of me must have known yeah. that it was possible yeah um sure yeah. enough it was there you go sure enough <laughs> um where can people tap into some of your stuff and check out what you got going on well i'd love for people to come over to the podcast over at non with it you get to mm -hmm. hear me coach and do therapy kind of sessions with people on the air so come check out there follow me on instagram it's my favorite social media platform mm -hmm. or just go to my website christy nassler those are the places awesome yeah all right thanks everybody thanks everybody bye, bye. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to subscribe. Also, share with any friend that you think might benefit from it. And lastly, go to AubreyMarcus.com, sign up for my newsletter diary, and you won't miss a thing.